the situation we find ourselves in is kind of like a bowling alley. And we've got these two gutters uh, on one side, uh, on, on both sides. On one side of the gutter, we have uh, what we call catastrophes. Uh, catastrophes are the decentralized capacity for anyone to cause exponential damage. I mean, by the way, a meme could be a catastrophe. The fact that just recently on TikTok, uh, someone could post, as they did recently, uh, and suggest that December 17th will be National Shoot Up Your School Day. So let's say I'm Russia, right? And I want to spread that meme that this could be National Shoot Up Your School Day. Um, it's just a rumor. But I can post that on TikTok, and it has a certain carrying capacity. It has a certain enragement, incitement, inflammatory capacity that all these kids are going to say, is this real? Is this, should I not go to school? And this is exactly what happened. There's a, if you look up on People magazine, there is a, a big uh, article about it. My understanding is that actually no shooting did happen. But if I'm Russia, I win in both cases. Either a shooting does happen, and I've created stochastic terrorism, or nothing happens, and I've still created mass panic, and I've helped overall prime people for panic. So to make this example concrete in the, the two gutters analogy, uh, the ability for smaller and smaller actors to deploy an exponential consequence, whether that is, you know, millions and millions of people being aware of National Shoot Up Your School Day, even though that doesn't exist, um, or, you know, the ability for anyone to build a drone and to point it at, you know, sensitive targets, uh, for anybody to build um, viruses in their, in their basement, these are all catastrophe. So we, we don't want that. That's one of the dystopias that are the bad scenarios we don't want to happen. On the other gutter, we have dystopias. Dystopias are surveillance states that are basically monitoring the use of all of these dangerous technologies. Because of course, you're going to need to have regulations. You're going to need to say, well, maybe we should make sure people don't post these uh, rumors about national shoot up your, your school day, or we should make sure that we regulate who can get a genomic, uh, you know, desktop uh, gene compiler on their on their on their desktop computer, or who can access CRISPR, or maybe we should regulate who can buy drones. Um, but again, that leaves you more towards an authoritarian, draconian, dystopic society where everything is monitored and surveilled, and then whoever has the power of that government, you know, maybe you don't want that to, to exist, and that's more of the China model. So, and those, the, each of those gutters are getting bigger. I think it's important to say. So we have on the catastrophe side, we have more and more technologies that make up decentralized capacities to, to create a catastrophe or chaos. And on the other side, governments that are able to, with sur surveillance at scale, uh, take up and monitor more and more space uh, on, on that other side. And so when we've articulated on this podcast in the past that we're looking to sort of find this thin little runway in the bowling alley, which is getting smaller and smaller every day, of what is a digital open society that recognizes the acceleration of these decentralized tech you know, capacities that are that are being built into society and put into more and more hands. And on the other side, making sure we don't create um, a kind of closed or authoritarian or surveillance uh, state. And that that is kind of one of the master problem statements that we all have to answer. And I know that, you know, what bring you and I both to this conversation is uh, not that we are naively optimistic, but the premise of it is we got to find the answer to that question. Um, and your book, I think, is, is really uh, anchoring us in in that situation through telling the history of various decentralized technologies, dynamite, AK-47s, um, and uh, communications technologies. So just curious to first lay that out there and let you maybe respond to it, and then we can maybe dig into um, you know, where w relevant stories from your book that, that might be able to sh sh shed some light. Sure. Well, I completely agree with that way of laying out the two gutters. And one of the things I was very worried about in writing this book, and actually before I began to write it. Uh, I don't believe in being an alarmist. I've been studying counterterrorism for decades, and I've always tried to find the way out or the, the solution to the problem or the more strategic perspective. And yet by talking about the ca chaotic side, the gutter that is all about how these technologies are used, and clusters of technologies in particular, I mean, you, you put that extremely well, Tristan. It's not just an individual te technology like facial recognition technology. It's also how do you then use uh, all of the other technologies that feed in with it, from drones to uh, autonomy and, and, and um, everything that's demonstrated in slaughterbots, but lots of other examples too. So how do you talk about that without having everybody go immediately to the other gutter, which is about put in place a surveillance society. You know, I, d I don't want to be justifying here moving from one gutter to the other gutter. 
that's not what the story is. It's, it is about how to find the middle way. You know, the Aristotle hit moderation and uh, the Romans would call it the via media. Th this is not a new problem. We need to find that moderation, that new way of governing. And I think it is possible to do it, but we're not focusing enough on both of the gutters, and in my case, particularly the catastrophic side, because there's already a major change in how conflict is unfolding, not just individual conflict like the increase in mass shootings in the United States, individual violence, really scary. Between 2010 and 2018, I think we've gone to an average of something like 21 active shooter incidents a, a year. I mean, it's just really horrifying Terrific. what's happened. And uh, you know, how do we go from, from looking at the individual types of violence to understanding what's happening in a bigger picture? And there's this intersection between mobilization through social media and other forms of communication, increased reach by which we can talk about uh, quadcopters and other types of projections of force, and then finally systems integration where you can use AI and other kinds of um, tools to, to give that kind of power, unprecedented power, to small groups. Let, let's actually uh, dig into that because I think that, that framework of mobilization, reach, and systems integration, uh, that might sound like abstract topics for folks. I'd love to just break down exactly what you mean, because it's almost kind of a, a military sort of theory or military technology theory sort of view of the thing. So could you explain what you mean by mobilization uh, and, uh, and reach and, and integration? Sure. Well, mobilization was one of the things that caused the nation state to come into being. I mean, you had with the French Revolution, the levee en masse, which was basically conscription, which enabled Napoleon's armies to develop huge numbers of people on the battlefield. And that was the beginning of conscription and the extremely powerful numbers that were in the professional armies that went to war with each other in the First and Second World War. So mobilization was at the very heart of power for states. What I'm arguing now is that mobilization is no longer under the control of states or armies. It's now under control of individuals or sometimes nefarious actors sometimes we can mobilize for good things uh, if it's a you know a cause that you support or if you're trying to fight a social justice uh, cause or, or you're bringing attention to abuse of power or police killings there, there are lots of ways that mobilization is is bringing positive effects but it's also bringing people to the battlefield not just ISIS. ISIS is the example that everyone knows best. That was the most dramatic example. But we also see mobilization of people to carry out violence individually. So you have the Christchurch shootings where that um, perpetrator was mobilized by what he had read on the internet and then he used live streaming to mobilize others to follow him. And you can see a contagion effect of many other people copying what what people who have sent their messages out do. And we have an increase in violence, an increase in anger, an increase in the ideas that oftentimes lead to that violence. That's what I mean by mobilization. And social media, of course, is probably the key factor in all of that. It's the tool that allows for decentralized mobilization. So what I hear you saying is that I could have a state that conscripts an army, and that's I can move 100,000 people from this to this territory, and I'm Napoleon. That's previous era. New era is, I'm an ISIS terrorist in Afghanistan or Iraq, and I broadcast on Telegram channels, and I can get, you know, 5,000 people to move from Europe to Syria or something like that um, through propaganda. So that's that first piece of mobilization. So then the second piece of reach? Reach is about the ability to project lethal force. And you can use um, a quadcopter that's got, uh, I mean, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be extremely powerful. So you can attach a, an explosive to a quadcopter and, and send it over and into the uh, governor's compound in Kunduz in Afghanistan, which happened uh, about a year and a half ago. You can um, use explosives to have a kind of a leveraged effect. Remember that having an effect is not just having large numbers of people on a battlefield. It's also giving power to people who can have a political effect that's very targeted, and then they spread that political effect through the first factor, which is mobilization. So the ability to use reach through um, facial recognition technology, through algorithms, through AI, through um, technologies that formerly were only under the purview of an army, 
through, through capabilities that might only have been able to be used by an army. That's what we're seeing. That's the key thing that I, I got in reading, you know, this part of your book, which is, yeah, I mean, obviously an army could move, you know, projectiles from one part or have a missile that can shoot thousands of kilometers or something like that. But increasingly, we're decentralizing those capacities. And so more and more people have access to be able to, with a drone, say, just even that little bit, move something through time and space uh, within you know, thousand, uh, well, some some radius that's, that's smaller. Um, and then the last thing you were talking about was uh, was autonomy and, and integration with direction? Yes. Well, uh, as is you know well known, it's very difficult to integrate all of these technologies. And it used to be that you had to have a command center, you know, a national command center in order to do that. But now, because of um, the ability to download algorithms, the ability to integrate through um, AI techniques, you can actually have very complicated systems that are working well with each other. You don't have to rely on advanced highly trained human beings and the strong structures that states had before now. So it used to be that you had to have a national army for all three of those things. And now you've got, you know, the Houthis in Yemen and, and uh, you've got lots of non-state groups that are increasingly powerful and it's the leverage between these two. It's not that they can go toe to toe with the US military, but they don't have to. What's better is to operate under the radar below the level of physical armed response mm -hmm. and have a political impact that hollows things out from within. Yeah, completely. I mean, 9-11 would have, could have only killed, what, 3,000 something people on that day. But then the use of that event to become propaganda, to recruit many more people and to spread that and market target that into uh, other groups that can be ra radicalized and recruit more people into bin Laden's, you know, Al-Qaeda and ISIS networks and so on. So it's not just the number of people that are killed, it's the ability to enact power, to to use asymmetries of power in, in a new way. Yes. And one thing that's kind of sobering to look at the difference between how al-Qaeda mobilized and how ISIS mobilized. When al-Qaeda tried to get followers, it was very worried about alienating them through showing too much violence, through having through attacks that might harm innocent civilians. They, they thought that that would cause a backlash and they wouldn't be able to continue to draw people to them. Then you get to ISIS and they have a completely different model for mobilization and they're taking advantage of horror and rage and you know the kind of violence that that grabbed people's attention and that kind of mobilization is only developing even more and it's one of the reasons why you have people who are maximizing or or going more strongly towards the horrible it gathers their attention